Tragically, it's not uncommon to find churches where the resurrection is taught as a symbolic myth rather than an historical fact. But today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg reveals that our entire faith hinges on the reality of this one event. Alistair is teaching today from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19. The resurrection is absolutely, fundamentally, crucially vital. Remove it, and there are disastrous consequences. Now it is to this that Paul gives himself, beginning in verse 12. If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, as it is preached, he's just said that for 11 verses, how then can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Let me show you, he says, the logical consequences of such a perspective. Let me, he says, for the sake of argument, allow for a moment that your position is factual, that what you're actually claiming, some of you, is correct, and that there is no resurrection then let me show you what the implications are. There are seven of them. We'll go through them. No resurrection, then Jesus isn't alive. No resurrection, preaching's futile. No resurrection, faith is irrelevant. Without the resurrection, the apostles are all false witnesses, and indeed, all who preceded and followed them. Verse 15, more than that, he says, We are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. And of course, we know that. He was clear about his proclamation. The people were clear about what they heard. Paul says, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus is not resurrected. And if Jesus is not erected, Peter was on the streets of Jerusalem lying through his teeth. And so was I in Athens when I came to this great pluralistic culture, and I saw all these idols to the unknown God, etc. And I said to them, listen, folks, God has given proof of what I'm telling you by raising Jesus from the dead. So says Paul, in those kind of statements, without a resurrection, we declare ourselves to be liars. You see, the apostles were not advice givers. They were gospel proclaimers. They had testified that God had raised Jesus from the dead, and if there was no resurrection, then they were detected as individuals lacking in integrity. This is quite a staggering thought, is it not, when you think that the apostles died for the proclamation of Jesus and the resurrection? The people tell me, say, well, it was a, it was a mythology, you see, and the disciples made this up because the thing had got going well, and it had gone into a kind of reverse in this experience at Golgotha, and they got together in a room and said, hey, we were having a, a great time doing all that stuff. Why don't we just crank it up again? It's the suggestion that the disciples went out, and on the basis of pure fabrication about which they knew, they got themselves killed. John Blanchard's lovely, succinct statement, let it ring in your mind. Men may die for a conviction, but men will not die for a concoction. And their conviction post-Calvary was that Jesus was dead. That was their conviction. When the ladies came from the tomb and said, He is no longer there, He has risen, just as He said, the response of these men on the basis of conviction was, You are out of your tiny mind. So how in the world did they hit the streets saying the absolute reverse of that? And I am asked to believe with modern man one of these paltry little explanations while man in his arrogance will not bow down before the truth of Scripture and realize that the great balance of evidence leads a man or a woman to the very conviction of this truth. It's pride that keeps you from believing, sir. 
It's pride that keeps you from believing, madam. If there is no resurrection, fifthly, you are still in your sins. In other words, all the hell that we know in this earth, all of our sinful thoughts, all of our rebellions, all of our cursings, all of our cheating, all of our dreadful arrogance, still is attached to us. And there is no way to get clean. We're in the dreadful predicament of Lady Macbeth. Our hands are stained with the blood of our sinfulness, and we want these damned spots to be out, but all the perfumes of Arabia cannot deal with them. And on our hands is the very damnation which awaits us in our future. If there is no resurrection. Now, what is Paul doing here? What he's doing is perfectly clear. He is helping these individuals to see the illogicality of this assertion. Because these folks knew that they were no longer in their sins. You only need to go back to chapter 6 and realize what they were. They were idolaters and homosexuals and perverts and cheats and liars and disobedient and a bunch of riffraff, unbelievable, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And says, Paul, that's what some of you were. That's what you used to be. And they knew they used to be. They knew they were different. They knew they were changed. And so now he says to them in chapter 15, think it out. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then you're still in your sins. And they must have said to one another, but we know we're not in our sins. That's the point he was getting at. So that they would then say, you know what? There is a resurrection. There has to be. Otherwise, we would still be trapped and chained by all these things. You see, it points up as well, dear ones, this morning, that the issue of a man and a woman outside of Christ is not that they are simply misdirected and in need of direction. It's not simply that they're unhappy and in need of happiness. It's, it's, it's a much deeper predicament. It is this, that we are in our sins and we can't get out. We're burying ourselves deeper every day. Indeed, Paul says to the Ephesians, describing their pre-converted condition, he said, you were dead in your transgressions and in your sins. You were absolutely stuck, and you couldn't liberate yourself. He says to the Colossians, you were dead in your sins. And Jesus looks the Pharisees in the face, and he says to them, listen, guys, you will die in your sins without a resurrection. Their past is useless. Without a resurrection, their future is nowhere. Second last, without a resurrection, those who have died are lost. That's verse 18. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Every funeral that I have conducted over the last 20 years of pastoral ministry, I've stood and, and, and stood on the basis of lies, spoken the words, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Every time I've said that over the last 20 years, I have simply stood up and spoken out a lie if there is no resurrection. That's why, for the life of me, I can't understand how a man can be in pastoral ministry and not believe the fundamentals of the faith. I don't, I don't know what in the world you have to talk about or what you're supposed to do or how you can lead and guide a congregation. Without a resurrection, death is not falling asleep in Jesus and waking up to see the smile of his face. Without the resurrection, death is a hard confirmation of our lostness. Without a resurrection, death means that we're all doomed to perish, that we all live without hope and without God. And one of the characteristics of paganism in every generation is that it is just that. It's without hope and without God. Paul says, if you take away the resurrection, then the Christians are in the same predicament as the pagans. Our whole existence, our past and our present and our future, has come to absolutely nothing. Now, like me, you're saying, could we please get to verse 20? Because I noticed there's a but at verse 20, and uh, I think it gets a little more encouraging from there, Al. 
And uh, this is sort of weighing me down a little. Well, it's supposed to. Supposed to. And if it doesn't weigh us down to the point that we realize what a wonderful, amazing change has been unleashed in our lives as the Spirit of God has opened our eyes and unstopped our ears, then it ought to weigh us down when we think about our non-saved friends and loved ones and colleagues to whom we return tomorrow, because they are dead in their sins. They're without hope and without God in the world, without any resurrection from the dead. Preaching's useless. Faith is futile. Nothing has any hope. There is no future. No wonder punks write on their jackets, no future. No wonder the songs of the present generation just cry out the angst of the 60s. It hasn't just come around as a fashion. It's come around in the awareness of the fact that everybody said in the 60s it was getting better, a little better all the time, and it got a little worse all the time. And here we are, and we're in deep trouble, and the, and, and the young people are saying, this stinks. This absolutely is horrible. And they're right without a resurrection. Without a resurrection, go out and become a hedonist. Without a resurrection, go out and find a cause. But don't, for goodness sake, let us live the way we're living now, with a mortgage and a garage door opener and scrambling through our days and saying, Woo, this is fun, isn't it? The answer is you take away the resurrection, and it gets less fun all the time. That's why Hemingsway took a shotgun, blew the top off of his head in his mansion, because he understood life is a dirty trick, a short journey from nothingness to nothingness. Can't have it both ways. Last of all, without the resurrection, we are of all men most to be pitied. Most to be pitied. That's verse 19. If for this life only we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Now, some people think that what Paul is implying here is that the Christian life is a kind of mean existence at best, and so hopefully there's a prize at the end, otherwise it's a raw deal. You know, like, uh, I know this is tough, but you're getting an ice cream after the dentist, that sort of thing. Now, only another minute to go, and then we go out for a milkshake, and so as long as there's a milkshake, but I go through all this, and then I find out no milkshake, I am ticked. And what he's saying here is you take away the resurrection, and it's just this, 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 and nothing. Now, the point that he makes, he makes from verse 17 on. Just follow his logic. He says, listen, by believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we've placed our faith and trust in Jesus to forgive our sins. That's what these folks have done. But he says, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then that means that not only do we not have present forgiveness— but we've also lost all hope for the future as well. So you can't say, well, at least I'm forgiven my sins just now, and uh, there'll be something later. He says, no. If there's no future, the present's shut down. And if we have believed in the future, when there's no future, then of all beings, we are the most to be pitied. Not because Christian existence is interested only in the future, but because the loss of the future means the loss of the present and the loss of the past. If there's no future, the present is irrelevant. Yesterday's dead and gone, and tomorrow's out of sight. So let's party. A la Janis Joplin, Chris Christopherson, anybody you like. That's the modern existential view. Yesterday's dead and gone. Tomorrow's not coming. Now is the time. Existentialism, let's have it. There's no resurrection. There's no judgment. There's no place to go. It's oblivion. It's annihilation. When you're dead, you're gone. Wait a minute. Do you ever consider the possibility of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Forget that. Dead men don't rise, therefore Jesus didn't rise. Oh, that's real scientific. I must... Yeah, we must come back to that sometime. Atoms don't split, therefore you can't split the atom, therefore put that aside. Large objects cannot rise off the ground and fly through the air. It doesn't happen, therefore it won't happen, therefore there's no law of aerodynamics, therefore there's no flight. No vessel could be made large enough to carry enough coal to cross the Atlantic Ocean. It is impossible, therefore it will never happen, and so on and so on. Science doesn't go at things that way. 
Science starts with possibilities, lays out the opportunities, examines it on the basis of that. But when people come to faith, they don't want to believe. Therefore, we start and marshal our arguments to that end. Now, let me just finish with this thought. This whole paragraph ought to be deeply disturbing to those who try and make the Christian faith more acceptable to modern man by getting rid of the hard stuff. Last year in Britain, a bishop removed one of the clergymen in the Anglican Church. Some of you may have followed this. This is from the Times, uh, the, the London Times. He removes this chap from office service, and the chap goes on a program on the BBC on the Wednesday night following the event. And the, the journalist says that uh, the, the pastor declared, when asked, no, he did not believe in God. This is the pastor. God, he said, was a concept humanity itself had created and represented no more than the potential for good within the human spirit. Looking serene, indeed almost angelic, and still wearing his clerical collar, the vicar said he had no idea what happened after death. The Lord's Prayer, though he kept repeating it, was no more than glorious doggerel. There had been no virgin birth, and Christ, by definition, was not the Son of God. Now, the mystery is not that the bishop removed him. The mystery is that his congregation wanted to keep him. Now, what was he doing? He was saying, listen, let's get rid of all the hard stuff, the difficult stuff, the miraculous stuff. Let's reduce Christianity to the things we really know, which is nothing. And then let's give nothing to everybody. If he'd only read 12 through 19 of 1 Corinthians 15, he would have realized that as soon as you remove that, nothing is exactly what you're left with. Now, here's the thing, loved ones. We're going to go on in verse 20 to pick up the affirmation by Paul in relationship to the resurrection. Reinsert the resurrection, and all of these things are immediately reversed. But listen, the nations of the earth are in need of this news. The people in our offices and in our streets and neighborhoods are in need of this news. The reason for this great emptiness that pervades so much of our culture is because of the work of the philosophers of the late 19th and early 20th century, fellows like Bertrand Russell and uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. I came across this week in my study a quote from Sartre's journal in 1980, and I'll finish up with this. In 1980, he writes in his journal, the idea that there is no purpose, only personal petty ends for which we fight, the idea that we make little revolutions, but there is no goal for mankind. One cannot think such things. They tempt you incessantly, especially if you are old and think, oh, well, I'll be dead in five years at the most. In fact, says Sartre, I think ten, but it might well be in five. In any case, the world seems ugly, bad, and without hope. There, that's the cry of despair of an old man who will die in despair. But that's exactly what I resist. I know I shall die in hope. But that hope needs a foundation. Four weeks later, they laid Sartre's body in the dust of French soil. See, he lived all of his life logically, resolutely, concluding the lack of factuality of these things. He was so bright that he understood it. This leads me to total hopelessness. Then he says to himself, but I resist that. I shall die in hope. Then he says, but hope needs a foundation, full stop. Presumably, he closed his journal and he said, I'm going to have to go get that foundation. Did he find it? Have you found it? If there is no resurrection, Jesus is not alive, preaching is futile, faith is empty, the apostles are liars, dead people are gone for good, 
there is no future. Verse 20, but in fact, Christ is risen from the dead. Great story out of Czechoslovakia. It came out of the revolution. The communists had charge of this vast crowd in a square in Czechoslovakia, and they're all gathered there. And uh, one of the uh, bishops from the Orthodox Church came up and said that he would like just uh, a moment to speak to the crowd concerning uh, Christianity. The, the communist official said, well, five minutes is all you're getting, and, uh, and, and that's your lot. Oh, said the bishop, I only need 20 seconds. And he stood up and he said, Jesus Christ is alive. And the whole square responded, Jesus Christ is alive. Alistair Begg with a message from our series titled Life After Death on Truth for Life. If you'd like to listen again, you can visit the sermon archive at truthforlife.org. But for now, keep listening because Alistair will be back to conclude this message in just a minute. The reality of Jesus' resurrection changes everything. How we think about life or death, our relationship with God. And it reminds us that our Savior is still alive today. His mission continues through us, through his followers. That's the subject of an engaging resource we are featuring today. It's titled Mission Accomplished. This is a 14-day devotional for families, and it's designed to help you and your children or grandchildren gain a deeper understanding of the death and resurrection of Jesus and how we should respond to these realities. The study traces Jesus' last days on earth, beginning at Palm Sunday all the way through his ascension to heaven, each day in the devotional, there's a song or an activity to help your child engage with the lesson in a memorable way. We would love to send you a copy to express our thanks for your support of this ministry. You can request your copy of Mission Accomplished Now, and that way you'll receive it in advance of Easter, and you can begin it as a new family tradition this year. There are just a few days left, so don't wait. If you're a truth partner, simply go online to truthforlife.org slash request to ask for Mission Accomplished. Or if you're making a one-time donation today, you can request the devotional by calling 888-588-7884. You can also give online at truthforlife.org slash donate. And don't forget, this coming spring, Alistair will host the 2018 Basics Conference, he welcomes Tim Savage and Christopher Ash as speakers. This is a time of biblical refreshment and fellowship for pastors or men in church leadership. The conference takes place May 7th through the 9th. It's at Parkside Church near Cleveland, Ohio. Registration is filling up fast, so sign up today or sponsor your pastor's registration when you visit basicsconference.org. Now here's Alistair to conclude today's message. Father, there is only one response to this. That is to acknowledge the logicality of this reasoning and to cry out to you for mercy and for grace. If Jesus is not alive, if resurrection is not true, then the whole thing is over, past, present, and future. If he is, then his love, so amazing and so divine, demands our souls, our lives, our all. Help us to think clearly that we might respond properly and live rightly. For Jesus' sake, amen. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you'll join us tomorrow as Alistair describes the comfort we have as believers, knowing that death is not the end. Be sure to listen Wednesday. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life, where the learning is for living.